I welcome all the delegates uh, on this very interesting seminar on sulfonylureas and diabetes. And I'm thankful to the eventers for organizing this and inviting me to participate in this. We have two uh, sessions today. The first session will be taken by Dr. P.C. Minoria on glucodynamics of modern sulfonylureas. And Dr. P.C. Minoria was a past president, CSI, API, ICC, and past dean, ICP. He was a past chairman, Hypertension Council, Society, Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, and past vice president, Sark Cardiac Society. He was awarded Lifetime Achievement Award during the WCCPC 2008 by Bharat Ratan Shri Abul Kalamji. And he had... Um, um, uh, He's had a, a Master Teacher's Award in the Indian College of Physicians in 2019, Netaji Oration Award in NAPICON 2022, and Awards in Excellence in Academics in Alumni PGI Chandigarh 97. He's, he's organizing several national and international conferences for the last 40 years, including the first World Cardiometabolic Medicine 2019 in 2019 in Mumbai. He, he has edited more than 33 books and has more than 70 publications in various national and international journals. And he had delivered almost more than 500 lectures in various national and international conferences. And today he'll be speaking about glucodynamics of modern sulfonylureas. Over to you, sir. Is it okay? Yeah, doctor, it is visible. Okay. The slides are visible. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Today we are going to talk on a very focused topic in diabetes that is glucodynamics of modern sulfonylureas. All of us know the treatment of diabetes is multifaceted, glycemic control, which minimizes microvascular complications and minimizes metabolic and infective complications, control of risk factors like blood pressure, lipids, opacity, smoking, and so on and improving cardiorenal outcomes. But today the focus of attention is only on glucodynamics in diabetes with special reference to modern sulfonylureas. Now, when we look at the glucodynamics in diabetes, we have three components. The therapy should provide glucoconfidence, which means it should provide effective glycemic control. It should also be safe, which implies that it does not produce any harm to any of the vital organs in terms of cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality. And the third component is the glucoeconomics, which means it provides optimized therapy at an affordable cost. All of us know Sulfonylureas are very effective for glycemic control. The reduction in HbA1c is to the tune of 1.5 or even sometimes 2. In past, concerns have been regard, raised regarding the CV safety, but all of us know in 2019, the Carolina trial has established the CV safety of glimepiride and forever put the issue of glycemic, uh, issue of CV safety to rest. The modern sulfonylureas like glimepiride also have less hypoglycemia and the weight gain is also less compared to the old sulfonylurea. So in the present state of time, there is a new facelift for modern sulfonylureas like glimepiride. Despite the hype created by a panoply of new agents in the Indian context, sulfonylureas are still extensively used throughout the country. Sulfonylureas represents one of the oldest and the most commonly used antihypoglycemic agent for treatment of diabetes. In 1937, the first report of hypoglycemic activity of sulfonylureas was discovered, and 46 we had the mechanism of action of sulfonylurea, that is, they stimulate insulin secretion. And in 1950, the first generation sulfonylureas were approved for clinical use. And so they are available for the last 70 years. And these first generation sulfonylureas, you can see on the screen, talbotamide, chlorpropamide are no longer used in 16, we used to use chlorpromide and tolerabotamide 
chlorpropamide was available as diabetes, but they are not longer, no longer used. In 84, we had the second generation sulfonide ureas, the glybenclamide, which is also not commonly used these days. Uh, we have glipizide, glicoside, and in 1995, we have the third generation uh, sulfonyl urea, the glimipride, which is commonly used these days. When we look at the sulfonyl urea from the view of the duration of action, short term sulfonyl urea, tolmitamide, no longer used, intermediate are used, glipizide, glicoside, and we have long term sulfonyl ureas, glybenclamide, glicoside MR, glipizide MR, glimipride, and carbotamide is no longer used. Now, it is very important to be familiar with the mechanism of action of the sulfonyl ureas. As you can see on the slide, the sulfonyl urea bind to the sulfonyl urea receptor in the uh, pancreas beta cells, and they close down this receptor. Once this is closed down, uh, the membrane is depolarized, and this leads to opening of the voltage-sensitive calcium channels. The calcium gets in, they combine with the insulin vesicle, and this results in exudation of insulin into the blood. What is important to remember is that the sulfonyl urea receptor 1 is predominantly seen in the beta cells of the pancreas, 2A is predominantly seen in the cardiac muscle, and 2B in the skeletal muscle. The new generation sulfonyl ureas like glimipride predominantly act on the beta cells of the pancreas, and therefore they preserve ischemic preconditioning, unlike the old sulfonyl ureas, like the glybenclamide, which blunt the ischemic preconditioning, which is a vascular protective uh, phenomena. Now, before looking at the modern sulfonyl, it is very important to understand very clearly the nuances of sulfonyl ureas. Firstly, all of us should know that sulfonyl ureas are mainly secretogogs, which means functional beta cells have to be prepared, prepared, present for the secretagogue action of sulfonyl urea, and 30% of beta cells should be intact in water making. And therefore, they are very useful in early and intermediate stage of type 2 diabetes and are less effective in late stages as the beta cells start declining. And obviously, they cannot be used in type 1 diabetes. The second nuance of sulfonyl urea is they produce glucose-independent action. Their action is not dependent on the blood glucose, and therefore hypoglycemia is inevitable with use of sulfonyl urea. But the modern sulfonyl ureas like glimipride and glicoside have low incidence of hypoglycemia. And therefore, when you are using these agents, you must learn how to minimize hypoglycemia in a patient of sulfonyl urea so as to get the optimum benefit of these modern sulfonyl ureas. The third nuance is that they are very potent agents. We'll show you the data. And therefore, the drug should be administered before a large meal. And dosage should not be, should be increased gradually after sufficient length of time. You should not suddenly increase the dosage. Otherwise, it ends up in hypoglycemia. Now, if the... HbA1c target is more than 1.5. We usually use shift to a dual therapy or triple therapy. And these are the agents which you can see on the slide which are commonly used. Sulfonyl urea is also one of the common agents besides the glitazones, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the DPP4 inhibitors, or the AGI, depending on the subset of the patient. Now let's look at the glucoconfidence of the modern sulfonyl ureas. Now, this is a meta-analysis, and you can see in this meta-analysis, nine trials with mean duration of 16 weeks, sulfonyl urea monotherapy reduced HbA1c as much as 1.51 as compared to placebo. Most of the newer agents decrease HbA1c by, say, 0.67 to 1 at the most, but sulfonyl ureas are the most potent oral agents for glycemic control. Now, when we look at the effect of different dosage of glimipiride, as you can see on this, the change in the baseline for glimipiride, if you look at one milligram, the reduction is uh, minus 
uh, 2.4. If you use 4 milligram dosage, it becomes minus 3.9. And when you shift from 4 milligram to 8, slight increase becomes 4.1. And this is written in the slide in millimoles. One millimoles is equal to 18 milligrams. So this is the second thing is when we look at the uh, other uh, postprandial. This was the fasting in postprandial. If you use uh, one milligram, the reduction is minus 0 0.35. When you increase the dose by four, it becomes minus 0.51. And if you further increase, uh, the reduction is only. 5.2, which means uh, changing from 4 to 8 only offers uh, slight uh, incremental benefit. That's why most of the uh, physician, diabetologists, and cardiologists uh, use up to 4 milligrams. And if you look at uh, the right-hand side, the effect on HbA1c, you can see if you use 1 milligram, minus 1.2. If you use 4 milligram, minus 1.8 in this study, which is very substantial. And if you further increase to it, it becomes minus 1.9. Now the efficacy and the sustainability of modern sulfonylurea ureas are similar to DPP-4. You can see in this slide, the reduction in the adjusted mean HbA1c are similar with linagliptin, which is minus uh, 0 0.16, and clomipride is 0 0.36. And the predefined non inverted criteria of 0 0.35 was met. And this showed the safety and efficacy of the glipopride versus citagliptin in combination with metformin in type 2 diabetes data from the START study. And you can see at 12 weeks, both these treatment groups demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in HB1C from baseline. However, the mean reduction in HBs and from baseline was significantly greater than glimipride blue, the dark blue, compared to citagliptin, which is the light blue. And this shows the safety and efficacy of glimipride versus citagliptin in combination with metformin type 2. Again, data from the same start study. And as you can see, at 12 weeks, the mean reduction in fasting plasma glucose and postprandial uh, plasma glucose was statistically more significant in the glimipride group versus the citagliptin, both in the fasting plasma glucose, uh, the dark blue is glimipride, and the light blue citagliptin, as well as in the postprandial uh, glucose. Now, this shows uh, the change in the A1C over time, and you can see uh, that there's no significant difference seen in the glycemic control. HbA1C level dropped more rapidly with glimipride, as you can see on the right half of the slide. But by the end of the trial, both groups, that is uh, the glimipride and the linagliptin, they returned to the baseline of 7.0. And this is the data on glimipride plus basal insulin combination. You can use when insulin, glargine with metformin is used, HbA1c uh, uh, less than seven achieved in 15.6. Whereas you use insulin glargine with glimipride, it is seen in 31%. Uh, and if all the three agents are used, it is seen in 34%. HbA1c goes less than 7.5%, seen in 43% with insulin glargine plus metformin. But insulin glargine plus glimipride, this is <clears> higher 56. And if you use all the three agents, it becomes 75. And this shows that if you use... Uh, uh, glimipride, the dosage of insulin is reduced right on the top is insulin glargine plus metformin. And then we have insulin glargine plus uh, glimipride, uh, number two graph and number three when all these agents are, three agents are used. And here you can see that glimipride and metformin has been used in different uh, combinations and permutations. We're starting from 0.5 uh, milligram uh, glimipride plus 1,000 uh, milligram metformin to you can see even four milligram glimipride with 1,000 milligram metformin. What about the safety of the modern sulfonylurea? Now, there are always three issues whenever we talk of uh, sulfonylurea. The first issue is hypoglycemia. The second issue is CV safety. And the third issue is weight gain. So let's see one by one, hypoglycemia 
as we already said because these agents are independent of the blood glucose hypoglycemia will always be there it is you you have to be careful and train your patient so that this is minimized if you look at glipipride it is only 10% glycanoclonide is at 36% Hypoglycemia with glipipride is much lower incidence because the active metabolite of glipipride has less hypoglycemic effect than the parent drug. And it exhibits a higher exchange rate and lower binding affinity to beta cells and secretes smaller amounts of insulin in the fasting state of post prandial And therefore, this I was talking that if you are using sulfonylurea, you have to train your patients that hypoglycemia is minimized because hypoglycemia is an integral part of all sulfonylurea. So first message is you should use modern sulfonylurea like glimipride and glycoside and not the older sulfonylurea where incidence of hypoglycemia is much higher. They should be taken before the large meal. The dose should be gradually increased, waiting at least for three to be four weeks before building up the maximum dose. Avoid in patients with CKD in elderly, Avoid concomitant use of drugs, which increase the action of sulfonylurea like the salicylate, the sulfonamide, the cyp 3 a 4 inhibitor like ketoconazole, PDP inhibitors like terithromycin others. And patient should always be told about the symptoms of hypoglycemia so that he can initiate treatment at the earliest and can be reversed at the earliest. The second issue always has been the weight gain. And uh, the weight gain with sulfonylurea is correlate with glucose with reduction in the glucotoxicity. The weight gain associated with sulfonylurea could be considered as an indicator of reduction in glucose uh, toxicity. Weight gain with sulfonylurea could be attributed to enhanced utilization of ingested glucose due to increased insulin levels. And the other reason for uh, weight gain is uh, many patients are scared of hypoglycemia, uh, and this is called hypoobesity syndrome, so that those patients who are, they continue to eat uh, more and more to avoid hypoglycemia. But the patient should be properly educated. Weight gain is least with modern sulfonylurea, like glimepride when compared to sulfonylurea. We'll show you the data. Now, this is a data uh, where uh, metformin and glimepride has been used in combination. And this is a good combination because uh, metformin has a tendency to decrease weight. And you can use when both these agents are used, there is no significant difference in weight gain. You can see strict glycemic control can be maintained with this combination in a real uh, life setting without relevant weight changes, 91.3 and 91.4. After five years, there's not been a significant change even after five years of this combination. And this is the landmark Carolina trial, which further reassure that there's no significant weight change uh, with modern sulfonyl ureas. Uh, the graph with the light blue is uh, glimmer pride and the one with the dark blue is linagliptin to the left half of your slides. So those in the glimopride group initially gained about 0.6 kg, you can see above the baseline, while linagliptin group lost one kg. But by the end of the trial, both the group had lost weight from the baseline. You can see both have come uh, below the baseline. Glimopride group weighed about 1.5 kg more than the linagliptin participant over the six years. What about CV safety? Ever since uh, UG Dave came into existence, uh, uh, sulfonylureas have been incriminated for increasing cardiovascular mortality and morbidity because in this trial there was excess of cardiac death, although this trial was carried out with old and sulfonylureas which are no longer used. The ADOPT trial showed no increase in senior CV events reported with glycoenchylamide versus sosigrutzine. All of us know glycoenchylamide also is. Uh, much less often used. The advanced trial, no effect on uh, macrovascular events, reduction in microvascular events with glycoside plus other glucose storing for intensive glycemia. And the UKPDS also no, show no difference in the rates of MI or diabetes related deaths with sulfonylureas versus insulin. And similarly, the incidence of cardiovascular events, pyo versus sulfonylureas was nearly same as in the Tosca trial. I'll show you the data. And finally, Carolina trial put to rest uh, the problem of CV safety of glimipride. There was no difference in the CV events when glimipride was compared to linagliptin 
over a period of six years. And this is the Tosca IT trial. You can see the incidence of cardiovascular event was similar in patients treated with sulfonylurea, which is mostly glipipride and glicazide, and those treated with pyo as an add-on therapy to metformin. And this is a meta-analysis of the modern sulfonylurea. You can see meta-analysis of 47 RCTs, 37,000 reveal that sulfonylurea are not associated with increased risk of MI and CV mortality. And this is the Carinola trial, which reassured the CV safety of glimmer pride. You can see both the curves are jetting against each other, and there was no significant difference in the occurrence of three-point maze in patients treated with glimmer pride compared to those treated with linagliptin, 12.0 versus 11.8, with a hazard ratio of 0.98, and it satisfied the non-inferiority. And this again shows the data on the cardiovascular safety. You can see whether you look at the three-point maze, whether you look at the four-point maze, it is non-inferior in terms of the three-point maze, CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or even the four-point maze. So it has established the CVs. And several publications have emerged that the modern sulfonylurea, they have good glycemic control, they have CV safe, and they are cheap agents. And here again, you can see the same thing, that the Carinola trial established the CV safety. It proved that CV safety is at par with linagliptin. It involved patients reflective of those seen in regular cardiology practice, and similar glycemic control was achieved with glimipride compared to linagliptin. And hypoglycemia with glimipride did not translate into excess CV harm. And this is glimipride. Hello? Preserves myocardial preconditioning, no effect on ATP sensitive potassium channels in the myocardium, little or no effect on the blood pressure, and no effect on reducing coronary flow. And lastly, a minute on the glucoeconomics. All of us know sulfonyl use is a cheap agent, and economics is a very great problem in our country, and they provide a cost effective approach. And we look at the use of anti diabetic agents in our country after metformin, sulfonyl use is the most commonly prescribed agent in our country and financial constraints comes as an important barrier in optimum utilization of anti-diabetic agents. And sulfonylurea, as you can see, it provides good glycemic control at a much cheaper rate and the savings can be used for other. So in summary, the modern sulfonylureas like glimipride are very efficacious in reduction of blood glucose Reduction in HbA1c may be the tune of 1.5 to 1.8 or 1.9. They are very safe. The Carolina trial has established the CV safety, and obviously they are very cost effective. And I'll show data on the side effects also that Gribbipride side effects, whether it is weight gain or hypoglycemia, is much less compared to other uh, uh, sulfonylurea. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I think the first question will go to, I think, both the speakers. Uh, what uh, to Dr. Uh, P.C. Manori and Dr. Omesh, when will, uh, where will you place sulfonylureas in the management of diabetes in the current context when we have other agents available? Your practice. The role of sulfonylureas in the management of diabetes in the current scenario in which we have other disease-modifying drugs also available. The management of diabetes is multifaceted. As I already told you, glycemic control is one of the facets. The other content is the cardiorenal protection, and the third is control of the risk factors like lipid. And even for glycemic control, you have to adopt combination therapy. Most of one, most of the diabetics would need combination therapy. So sulfonyl urea. Now we have sulfonyl urea, which are available as cheap agents. We have uh, Gliptins, which are available as cheap agents. We have DAPA, which is available as cheap agents. Only GLP is not available as a cheap agent. So most of the drugs are now available as cheap agents. Depending on the subset of patient, you can utilize all these combinations. For the poor patient, previously sulfonylurea was very good, but now we have other agents also. So depending on what is the glycemic control, depending on whether you have heart failure, whether you have CKD, you can utilize SGLT2 inhibitors, if uh, uh, glycemic control is very bad, you have to incorporate sulfonylurea also besides other agents. So it has to be a combination of various therapies. Dr. Omesh? Uh, yes. 
actually in our country still 70 to 80% of patients are using a combination of sulfonylurea and metformin but as the now ada guidelines have clearly suggested that the patients who have high risk of atherosclerotic cvd and heart failure sglt2 inhibitors have uh, become the first add on as uh, per the ada 2020 guidelines and now as sir has already said that the cost factor is now going on decreasing the dapa has gone down and even the gliptins uh, are coming down in the cost so now we have to individualize the therapy based on the risk the patient is facing as far as cardiovascular risk and renal risk is considered if the patient is having diabetic kidney disease patient is having microalbuminuria a patient is having atherosclerotic cvd and he is at high risk of heart failure then maybe sglt2 inhibitors may be a better choice and as far as cost is considered and sulfonylurea still remain a popular choice as far as cost is considered and we have seen that cardiovascular safety is still not uh, the, it has not bow in the neutral category and, um, among this third generation sulfonylurea we have glicalazide as well as glimepiride so how do you choose among the two how, how can we say that glimepiride is better than glicalazide anurya sir please Uh, both these sulfonyl ureas are good, so I think you cannot straight up say one is better. Both are good, and both have produced good results in various trials. Yes, efficacy wise, I think both are same. As far as renal data is considered, glycolazide, as per guidelines, may not require a change in dose in the moderate to severe kidney disease, while glimepiride will require a reduction in dose when we use it in a moderate kidney disease. So there is one distinction as well as diabetic kidney disease is considered. Otherwise, efficacy wise and cardiovascular wise, I think both drugs are good. I think uh, Dr. Joshi is asking uh, Dr. Omesh. Sulfonyl ureas with basal insulin precautions is hypo with modern sulfonyl ureas plus basal insulin a real concern, or any role of 0.5 milligram glimepiride in clinical practice? Yes, hypoglycemia and weight gain have to be watched for when we are using sulfonyl urea along with basal insulin. But we have seen in the data presented by me in last half an hour that that risk is minimal. But we have to be safe and smart, as the topic is today is safe and smart when we use. Uh, sulfonyl ureas we have to look at the safety and we have to be smart using the doses like sir has already manoria sir has said that the titration has to be slow it should not be very fast it should take at least 3 to 4 weeks to up titrate the dose of either basal insulin or glimepiride when using the uh, combination and 0.5 as far as clinical evidence is con uh, concerned and a lot of physicians are using is a very good choice when we start basal insulin we can use 0.5 because glimepiride is a very potent drug it can reduce up to 2% uh, of hb1c so even 0.5 may be um, beneficial when we use with basal right could be a very good strategy starting with 0.5 and 10 units of glycine Um, this is a question to Dr. P. C. Manoria. After the uh, Carolina trial, does the usage of glimepiride has increased in your practice? Because all the concerns with uh, sulfonylureas like weight gain, hypoglycemia, and CV safety has been answered beautifully by the Carolina trial. So, is the usage increased in your clinical practice after this trial? Yes, uh, all of us has become more confident with use of glimepiride after the Carolina trial, which have shown very good data of CV safety. That is true. I think, uh, I think uh, no, somebody is asking that the, the main USP of sulfonyl ureas was the cost, but now the cost of other agents like gliptins have reduced, SGL2 inhibitors have reduced. So now, where will you place the sulfonyl ureas when the cost factor is now almost the same at par with the other agents now? I think as I said, combination therapy is the rule in diabetes in the long run. So, uh, if you have a CKD or heart failure. You have to use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, but glycemic control with SGLT2 inhibitors is not to the extent of sulfonyl urea. If you have uh, uh, CK, if you have a coronary artery disease, you have to use GLP-1A, and you can use both these combinations. But whenever glycemic control is required on a greater magnitude, uh, sulfonyl urea usually comes into play in combination with the other therapies, depending on the subset of the patients. you can also use gliptins because glp are still very costly so it's always a combination therapy 
and depending on what is the subset of the patient. But it's a good thing that most of the antidiabetic agents have become cheap, except the GLP-1. Efficacy wise, I think efficacy wise, I think HbA1c reduction will be faster and greater with sulfonylureas. That advantage will, I think, always remain with sulfonylureas. I think a very interesting question is asked by one of the attendees in the present context. In the now the Ram, Ram, Ramzan and it's coming the holy month of Ramzan. So your thoughts on the use of sulfonylureas in Ramzan, keeping in keeping in mind the hypoglycemia point, Doctor Umesh. Uh, yes. Uh, as far as gliptins and metformin is considered and glitazones are considered, there is no dose modification required in the month of Ramzan. But as far as sulfonylureas are considered, both glimipiride and glitazide may need a reduction of dose by about 50% during that one month period. Okay. And this question is by Dr. Prasad to Dr. P.C. Manoria. Is as sulfonylurea safe in congestive heart failure patients? Sulfonylurea Whenever we are faced with congestive heart failure, we don't use sulfonylurea. We will use SGLT2 inhibitors. We will use other non-antidiabetic like the uh, RAS blockers, the MRAs, and uh, even RNA and other drugs. So, so if a patient with heart failure, sulfonylurea should not be used. It doesn't have any favorable action in heart failure. It is safe. It is safe. It is not contraindicated in heart failure. Uh, sulfonylurea as far as heart failure is concerned. You you because sometimes we have to use sulfonylureas because the HbA1c is not coming down only with HGL2 inhibitors or gliptin sometimes. See, the problem is suppose a patient of heart failure has coronary artery disease, he develops unstable angina, it is better to avoid sulfonylureas. So our preference will not be for sulfonylureas. If you have a problem with glycemic control, you can go for insulin and other therapies. But we will try to control it with SGLT2 inhibitors and the sulfonylureas are usually not preferred because most of these patients will also have CKD. Sulfonylureas can create problem of hypoglycemia because of congestive heart failure. Liver is also a problem. So we usually do not recommend sulfonylureas for hepatic failure and renal failure. So sulfonylurea is not a good choice for patient because concomitant problems will always be there. CKD will always be there with uh, heart failure. So, uh, Mr. Keshwani and Ashish Patel, should, should we call it a day because it's already 9.30? Uh, yeah, yeah, sir. I think... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, sir, I we congratulate both the speakers, Dr. Umesh and Dr. Kishi Benoria, for a very lucid and beautiful presentation and a very interesting discussion. And I also thank all the participants for joining this. Over to the Adventist people for the final words. Uh, sir, yeah. sir, before the closing, there are also one question right now. It is there from Dr. Gupta, sir. Okay. Can take it up. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Which drug would be? The last question, uh, I sir, think. Which drug the, would be best? Yeah, you go ahead. This one, you go ahead. Yeah, sir. Which drug would be best for the patient to not land up into diabetic ketosis? Ketosis. I think Dr. Omesh can take this. Which is the drug which will not land you into diabetic ketoacidosis? See, ketoacidosis is a different, uh, basically, uh, scenario. SGLT2 inhibitors, we have to be cautious when we use because they have an obvious uh, a caution uh, there. And uh, all other drugs, a good situation like uh, septicemia, some sort of infection, a COVID infection which is going on, your sugars are going haywire. So their um, oral drugs may not be useful. And a patient who has impending ketoacidosis because of some sepsis or infection like COVID-like situation, here we may have to switch him over to a basal bonus therapy or an insulin infusion to prevent that thing. But the caution is only with SGLT2 inhibitors and not with other uh, drugs. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the faculty. I think you have taken the question really very well. Uh, Guru, uh, over to you, Guru, uh, for the closing remarks. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you so much once again. So on, on behalf of Sanofi, I take this opportunity to thank our both the eminent speakers, Dr. P.C. Manoria sir, Dr. Umesh Pasan sir, and our chairperson, Dr. Pankaj Manoria sir, and all our delegates who is taking their town, uh, time from their busy schedule. And we totally hope this will add to your current clinical practice. And we're looking forward to accept your feedback on the content of webinar. So once again, thank you so much for all the doctors for your online presence and uh, for active participation. And thank last you. but not least, 
very much stay safe and take care the covid is spreading uh, very, very pathetically so request to all for all doctors stay safe and take care sir thank you thank you so much from thank you, uh, from the sir thank you